Hey everybody, this is the Brothers Wist number 45. I am Greg Soule. Uh, let's see, what is this? April 29th. We're coming right up on the uh, the mum that's going to be shooting up pretty soon. Most of us are going to be there. Uh, Thomas Kurnak up there is going to be there. He's all the way from Slovakia. Hello everybody and yes, I will be there. Excellent. And then Tom Smith summarily is protesting and won't be there. Um, won't be there. <laughs> nope. <I'm> the farmer. <laughs> it's sad, man. It's sad. Uh, haven't seen you in a while. Uh, we've also got Mike Hammett all the way from Illinois. It, uh, I will be there as well. And, uh, given, uh, how do you not have that on our agenda? Uh, oh. I don't know. Yeah, it's on there. It's on there. It, oh, okay. I see it. I see yeah, it. Yeah, it's down there in your follow up. So I, uh, I'm going to go ahead and right off the bat apologize for my poor audio. For some reason, no matter what happens when I plug in a USB device in my laptop, it pretty much locks up. So I'm going to try and clean this up as best as possible. So hopefully there's not too much hum hiss. And hopefully I don't have to put too much effort into it because I am absolutely lazy. So let's. Well, uh, uh, if you think you're lazy with the videos, have you seen the videos that I upload to our page? No. I, well, I, I take it back. I've watched a few. I pretty much just cut at the very beginning when we start and cut at the very end, and that's all the editing I do. Sounds solid to me. I don't know. I, and you I, also I, cut my head out of the picture when I'm interviewing people, which is very annoying when you're holding the camera. It's like a yeah. physical edit. It's like you tilt it downwards and to the left. Now, to be fair, I corrected that like four shows ago. I got to stand. And still, the mic. Still love your mic, though. I'm just saying here. I heard Mike like, say that he was getting your best side when he did that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would have been focusing on the bulge. Okay, moving swiftly on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, moving on. All right. So let's uh, let's jump back to the last one. A little bit of follow up, 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 up. Some follow up. You can hear my children screaming. Sorry about that. Uh, follow up being uh, the last one. We were talking about a lot of the hardware that was announced at the EU MUM, and I got word that the MUPS is actually a dumb device. Um, the monitoring LED will just light up when the battery's uh, being used. So that's as intelligent as it is. Unfortunately, for I, Thomas was getting me hyped up. I was getting excited thinking this thing had a router board built in. But uh, Oh, I was so hyped up this way. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, was, I was already imagining all the countless situations where I could use it. And uh, yeah, well. Wah, wah. <laughs> but, uh, and then when I first saw these these notes get posted to our, our chat, um, I... I didn't know they came from somebody more official, and so I thought it was just viewer commentary. Uh, and so I, I saw MUPS, the dumb device. I'm like, all right, well, that's what we think of that device. I didn't realize that they meant it's 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 intelligence, uh, not the concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I thought they were. Yeah, for sure. Let's see uh, what other corrections follow up. So we had the uh, the 1100 AH X4, the one they're coming out. They're saying it has three switch groups, one through five, six through 10, 11 through 13, each with two five gigabit full duplex line to CPU. Yeah, that's an improvement on the original 1100 anyway, so. Yeah, so it's saying each with five gigs, so ports one no, through five, that, that would be each one could do it. Each with two point. Oh God, they do commas, don't they, over there? Each with two uh, and a half gigs. Well, it's a full duplex, so you could be talking about aggregate speed. So. Yeah. All right then. It's still better. Yeah, it's still an improvement. Yeah. Yeah. All that, right. Uh, yeah, and that's yeah, like that's basically meaning that it doesn't have anything in common with that previous architecture at all because each of them had one gig to the switch groups, and then you know. 11, 12, and 13, you know, I believe they all had their own dedicated one gig each. Um, and it was on its own Phi that was on, integrated with the CPU, and then the other one was uh, 12 and 13 were hideous, I suppose, would be one way to put it. So, sure. so if you wanted to route it, you'd want to use, let's say, on three ports, 
So you'd use one port from 1 to 5, one port from 6 to 10, and, one, and then 11. Uh, and then you'd stop. The other two ports were kind of fillers. Maybe mm-hmm. for management or something like that. Gotcha, gotcha. Let's see. Um, they were saying that... It wasn't entirely their fault. Like I think it was, uh, it was the vendor not releasing uh, good enough information on their hardware, so uh, they couldn't actually optimize their kernel for those two ports. So when they were doing all the advancements on raw forwarding and routing performance, um, is the only I suppose criticism might have is lack of transparency on that you know that they didn't say look actually you know you'd have to have a couple of emails with them and they go oh yeah there's an issue there you know that kind of it but other than that you know it's not in fairness not not everything's in your control i suppose when you're a hardware vendor yeah well i mean thinking about it too um where a lot of folks were using these were sort of on the edge of their networks as border routers and most of the people i know deploying them didn't have a gig of internet or they had no more than a gig of internet, so it worked out, I guess, for the most yeah. part. Well, you see, it's, it's where you see the, where I saw the issue was where people were used it, let's say, where they had a bit more bandwidth, but also uh, where you were, you wouldn't see anywhere, you know, on a single TCP stream, you wouldn't see anywhere near the performance that, you know, you were seeing on the Microtech uh, uh, test results, you know, like you're just, you you'd peak out at around 200 megabits per second on a single stream of those ports and then you'd but then if you put uh four streams or eight streams or four streams you'd get the 800 megs through it you know that kind of way hmm. but if you had a single stream you wouldn't while on the others you would get through it so it was um it's just i suppose and it's actually one of the things that openvsd try to get vendors to do is release open documentation about their their chips so that the developers can actually you know write write proper drivers and actually you know interact with the kernel in a much better sense like they don't like using binary blobs or um in fact they don't so they kind of write their own they try and reverse engineer um that so um but i think it's a kind of almost like a crusade they've been on trying to get people to release better and more open uh, drivers uh, for networking hardware for that reason to improve stability performance uh, and also stop ru- running third-party binary crap in your kernel you know but anyway sorry moving on sorry <laughs> no worries uh they said the what was that thing called thomas the womb or woobum <laughs> that weird woobum. little wireless yeah thing? i think it was woobum yeah yeah woobum uh the wireless out of band management dilly thing they said they had one there i guess they I mean, it's small enough, you'd miss it if you weren't really looking for it. And they said the 60 gig stuff, they had a, a link running up there. Two towers, they said, inside the registration hall, 50, 60 meters apart, running one gig full dupe the whole time. So that's neato. Yeah, nice. uh, that, uh, so I like to note that this is the first time that the Thomas has been wrong in the, on the podcast. <laughs> and in life. Uh, he said uh, he said that it was not there and it was. I'm sorry. I apologize yeah. for the grave mistake. That he must commit Sudoku. Uh, <laughs> he's brought like much shame Sudoku. to his face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I shall commit to do one paper or one Sudoku riddle. One square of puzzles, yeah. I mean, that's what the <laughs> Japanese people did. I used to think they would stab themselves, but apparently it was just math problems in these little squares. Uh, that's weird. Uh, let's see. Tom, you put a little bit of stuff on here. Open BSD, always beating that Open BSD drum. Look at you getting, you're just, you're, you're vibrating. You can't wait to talk about this stuff. You're the only guy I know that runs Open BSD routing. Um, I think it's because you're the only person crazy enough uh, to get out I there and do it. But there's kind of, I suppose, a contrarian view. Um, so I'm kind of not your average guy, I suppose, uh, as anyone yeah. met me no, with it. It's one way of saying it. I suppose, yeah, I suppose they're less of the, I suppose they're just, for me, sometimes you just want something that will do some simple and reliable, you know, ultra ultra reliability on it. So uh, that's kind of why we use them. But uh, I do quite why I've been explored it is for the cases where people just say, I wanted to do this very simple use scenario. 
because in fairness it is very difficult it is much more difficult to deploy stuff on it um there's a learning curve on it um how hard is it for your junior techs to jump in your boxes and do stuff um without run books it's it's difficult so like what we're trying to do uh, like we hired another engineer there recently so um kind of sat him down and i said look you're going to be learning microtech because we use it quite a bit uh but we also want you to learn over bsd and they're like oh deadly and i said yeah well wait till you see things. <laughs> let's wait till you see what you have to do to get things going being honest it's the kind of thing about what i like about it is what well, it's a pain in the ass to get new services deployed you know i will say that um but then again it's kind of like deployed a but like what Tom would have said about two years ago, I remember just about automation, uh, Thomas Kerlick was saying about automation, and that is the kind of the key is that once you develop a service and then you can stamp it out and you're not having to revisit routers, there's a, there's a value proposition there uh, in that, you know, and that's uh, kind of where we've been putting it in where, let's say, other devices haven't been performing as, as stably as we'd like. And uh, the results so far have been pretty positive. Um, it's freeing up time. So we sacrifice an enormous amount of time in development and learning um, the product or the device. But I have to say, once once you get something working, it seems to just churn away. Like uh, I suppose, like some of those guys with the Dodge Rams and their Cummins diesel engine, you know, they just keep going. So um, that's for my American friends there. Um, but, uh, so for basically us, saying it's set it attention. and forget it. You put it in place and it just runs. It takes just a little run. while to get there. And it's it's a, but it took it took a while to to get the let's say like it, I, I'll, I'll I'll give you an example when we did a, a failover system. I think we had one working for micro ticket about you know I think it was about an hour lapping it up. Now that's not fair because you know we've used micro ticket extensively for that length of time. And uh, you know, you know, but like the back of your hand, uh, open BSD, it took a couple of, I think it was a couple of months to, of actual work to get to work. It. But, but that said, I suppose I'm, I'm actually learning, so I'm studying for the BSDA and the BSDP, uh, which is like certifications and stuff like that. So, it's, um, so I'm banging the drum on the stability point of view that once you set it up it works uh, but it is it is an upper, uphill battle but I think it's it's one that they're unusual in that they don't try to make you want to use the product they kind of go if you want to use it use it and if it works great if it doesn't start coding yourself or start contributing or at least have a good test and it does force and it also puts the control back in your hands. You know, when you have an open source product that's not working well, um, you have the power to actually change that. Do you know that kind of way? Uh, and so far, I haven't had to use the power. I've just had to learn the documentation and read and do, the, and it does what it says in the tin. So that's, but it is a, it is certainly a contrarian view. But it was just um, like you saw me at sometimes uh, on the chats uh, on our private chat just losing my head a few times and just being quite uh, just when something was working well for us and uh, this has been a, a great way of, uh, for us just to and it's a totally different way of promotion we could go to another we could go to another vendor that's better at marketing but maybe yeah, not yeah. as good as site and that's what we were looking for was the technical brilliance, not the marketing essence. Do you I do you I look it's it's learning a new operating system is difficult. So uh, there's no way around that. The way we deal with the guys is just try and train them up. It's like uh, myself and my colleague Michael Cotter, we were just chatting about it and we said, What if you what if you train up the guys and they leave and they went, Well what happens if we don't train them and they stay? You know, yeah. like kind of we were just we were just having the crack like it was uh, it was actually quoted from uh, one of those LinkedIn type feeds that you see people writing that kind of nice little Yeah, I've heard that before. So Yeah. I guess either way you're gonna pay for it. Either you buy a commercial product that's easier to use or you go BSD and you just have to pay your employees more so one way or the other you're going to pay for it and you're just shooting for the stability aspect yeah exactly and the automation like that's something that is absolutely key yeah. that 
Um, speaking of that automation, I see because you said OpenBSD 6.1 was released, and in the notes in here you said it's got um, new switch and switch SDN controlled software, uh, open yeah. flow support as well, right? Uh, yeah, no, I. I'll be honest with you, I haven't used that feature yet because it was released on, I think, the 17th of April. Um, but right. I'm looking at using that. But I always thought OpenFlow was going to be just a fad and, you know, you it know, has, it's the has it? Pitch Hasn't pitch it disappeared? Yeah. Pardon? It seems like it's all but disappeared. I haven't really heard anybody talking about it for a long time. Yeah, no, well, you see, the only thing I'll say is that when you talk to, when you go to, let's say, like, sort of, Inog or something like that. The bigger players seem to use it. Like when I say that, I mean the the large, large. Uh, yeah, like, you know, you know, AT&T types. Uh, not not AT&T. More like this content. Let's say content generation networks or content networks. But so uh, and it, I, it certainly disappeared from my uh, micro. Like the way I would have looked at it always was OpenFlow was a, a network or a software engineer's solution to a network engineer's problem, you know, kind of way. So and I, I didn't think too much of it. Um, I suppose I'm looking at it from a point of view that I want to solve a particular problem with uh, with a, a design of my network, um, and it's to remove another type of device and replace them. And just if OpenFlow does it a better way for us, it makes it easier to manage. We'll do that. But it, but at the moment, it's literally confined to a box that's installed on my table right here, which uh, hasn't. Uh, it hasn't. <laughs> so it's just to see it. But in fairness, uh, it, it's been coming a while with OpenBSD. I think they had us you know, in the development uh, branch for a while and then they uh, they finally released it as production quality. So uh, we'll have a quick look at it. Um, but right. yeah, no, when I was talking about automation, it was more like um, what Thomas Kernack um, uh, would be into, which is Ansible or Puppet, you know, that type of way where you're actually, you have very consistent uh, deployments, uh, you know, for multiple edited multiple files and all that type of stuff across the US. Um, but I will say that once you get used to this stuff, it is quite easy to that it was a hell of a learning curve. Hell of a learning curve. What an intro. So uh, Justin Miller from Virginia just popped in. Hi Justin. Oh, we're recording already? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did not get that memo. No, it's good. You just interrupted a, a diatribe from Tom, so we're All good. Right. Any any other any other highlights for uh, OpenBSD? Eight minutes. <laughs> yeah, in 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 a tweet. If you had to oh, tweet sorry. about OpenBSD okay, so in closing like, words, what would it be? Uh, BGP large community support. Uh, I suppose point to multi point VX land support. And a binary patch and utility, which you'd think with a really secure OS that they would have had that ages ago, but they used to do source patches. So if you had to do a change, now admittedly under releases they usually have about you know a couple of patches uh, for security or reliability. So they're quite small of the amount of patches they use. I think there was maybe ten or fifteen in the last release. So, uh, but you, you know, they have enough mitigations in there that we haven't really had to patch much in our in our in our experience you know so uh hypervisor support which is early days yet and raspberry pi 3 support so they do have raspberry pi 3 support which i thought would never happen because of all the different blobs but somehow they've managed to get around the binary firmware that was closed source um on it but they've managed to get around that somehow so uh, happy days uh so Actually, do any of you guys know much about the Optron A1100s, the ARM server stuff from AMD? Just I know it's from AMD. That'd probably be more uh, an Andrew Thrift question. Cool. Well, it's just it seems to be something that might be worth to look at because uh, I was kind of going, oh, all right. It's actually something I missed. I saw the Raspberry Pi 3 and I went, oh, nice, out of bad device on a site. But, uh, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Moving on. Just tell me to shut up. Moving. Thank you, guys. Right. <laughs> it was only 10 minutes. That was, that was pretty good for you. Uh, yeah, that, was a good, that was a good time. You can tell he wants to do another 10 minutes, too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll do an encore here in a second. Uh, let's see. Moving oh, no, on down the list. Uh, 
some interesting news, big news from us is we're some doing interesting. a well, it's going to be a thing. It's going to be a thing for sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, we're doing a routing panel at the Denver Mom. It's going to be May 25th and 26th. I think we're on day two. They give us an, an hour, giving us an hour. So the idea being we had to kind of confine it to a sort of topic ish. So we said routing. Um, we're going to have Alex Hart. Uh, he's this is going to be his first kind of stage appearance. We're going to have Justin Miller. He's going to be on there. His first stage appearance. We're going to have JJ Boyd, mysterious JJ Boyd. He's still alive, still kicking. It's going to be me and Thomas Kernak as well. So I'll be the dumb guy in the room and I'll play uh, MC. And uh, these other guys are going to be able to answer as many questions as possible. Hopefully, we can get a lot of crowd interaction the idea is it's it's basically an ama you ask us a question and we're gonna make up an answer on the spot may be true may not be true you never quite know uh, i i really i love this idea i don't know why microtech hasn't done a panel of sorts before right but i think we've got a varied enough background of people where we can answer probably at least two of us can answer any one question with sort of a different perspective on it right um, so i think that's very different and cool and i want to bet that somebody's going to copy us uh next go around but you guys just need to remember who who innovated this one who started this one so yes uh, and actually i wouldn't call it an ama i'd call it an a m a a m all right ask me anything about microtech yes <laughs> yeah well this isn't a wisp conference this is a microtech conference so no, they obviously I'm, don't I'm want people <laughs> They don't want to ask you how to configure BGP in uh, a Cisco device or anything like that. They want to cheat you to well, yeah, pretty like, much you know, stick I'm saying to that, you know, more as you know, to the audience of, you know, keep the questions confined to microtech. Yeah, that's, and that's also, yourself. I would say make it questions that we can actually answer. Don't ask us when version 7 is going to come out. You know, don't ask <laughs> us uh, when they're going to release a router with 40 ports. It's like, I don't know. We're, we're not part of microtech we just use the products and so ask us questions that are feasible for us to answer hopefully uh, talk to technical Giannis or sales Giannis <laughs> or any of the other 60% of the population in Latvia that's named Giannis uh, it seems to be a very popular it's like John over there um, let's see you guys have anything else to say about that I'm doing a presentation on troubleshooting uh, Wilson Wilson's going to be there as well. He'll be on the panel, yeah. I believe. Uh, he's doing a presentation on mm, high availability best practices, I think. Any? Hey, Kernak, what are you? What are you doing a presentation on? I assume you're doing one. Yeah, doing an automation presentation. I actually presented this one in uh, Europe already, but uh, I figure you know, uh, US might also be a good crowd for for an automation based presentation. So. Oh yeah, yeah. Just, Probably just, that. Just, just be careful, because uh, Miller might get at you for recycling slides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I expect at least 5% new slides for you. <laughs> That's the uh, bar. Keep other the bar people high. have more stricter um, requirements, as in <laughs> at least 33% new slides, Tom. Um, well, I think you can, re you can recycle once, but as soon as you go to the third round of recycling that's when or the or the fifth time you were doing the same presentation then it's <laughs> time to, to you know it's hard find a new for... pony yeah i don't know man he plays mary had a little lamb really well like <laughs> practiced it a lot so don't ride him too hard uh, uh... anybody else have anything to say about uh the denver mom it's, uh i've seen some people on link talking about it so uh you know, I made sure to plug our, our session there, even though I won't be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, definitely a good, strong turnout. There's only a couple of us that aren't going to be able to make it. Um, the Australians are going to be there. The Irish aren't going to be there. Uh, and for and some Zealand. reason, the Chicago Jeez. guy. Yeah, I yeah. kind of lump in Australia, New Zealand. Like just drive there? I mean, okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, just grab a canoe. It's all the same. Um but yeah, yeah, good turnout. So hopefully, you know, a lot of you guys will come up and shake our hands and make an acquaintance. I mean, that's how all of us idiots got together. Was just bumping into each other at the mall. So there you My go. My biggest regret. <laughs> One of them, for sure. Uh, <laughs> let's see. 
Uh, let's move right along. We have Unimus 0.3.3 is out. Give us the highlights, Thomas. Uh, mostly SSH key support. That's the big one with this release. And then also some you know quality of life features and some bug fixes. Nice. Uh, we are actually getting ready for 1.0.0 release. So, oh, yeah. uh, so 033 actually if nothing major you know breaks and if no major bugs are discovered uh, is the last rc release so hopefully sometimes in may or, or maybe june we will release 100 and then that will be the the uh, you know like the uh, production grade that we we are completely happy with we know it works we know it's scalable we know there is no performance issues etc release so killer so if I'm an idiot and I don't know what SSH key support is, what does that mean? Uh, so basically, in, through SSH, you can, you know, when you SSH to a device, you need a username and password to authenticate against the device. And uh, SSH keys are a more secure way of authentication. So you don't actually provide a password. You need the actual SSH key instead of your password. That would be the easy version. Cool. Um, is that just going to be server-based, or is there any hardware that actually supports that? Um, so, yeah, like uh, pretty much anything that SSH supports SSH everything. keys. Right. Just about everything. everything. Of course, there is... Uh, you know, yeah. The... yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, it's on a, a different topic, so you can wrap up yours. <laughs> so, yeah, most of the SSH uh, servers out there, of course, support SSH keys, and most of your vendors <coughs> do as well. So. Cool, cool. All right, where are we going with that, Mike? So uh, I did some Googling uh, on, on the name Yamas in uh, Latvia and uh, trying to figure out how popular it actually <laughs> um, And I'm still looking. I, I did find one site that did say uh, about 5% of the population, or 5% of the boys are named Giannis. But interesting, given the context of why I started looking at that, is I came across an article in the Baltic Times entitled, Let Names Are More Than Just Giannis. <laughs> so apparently we're on the right track, and that's pretty popular. All right, there you go. Um, let's see, scooting right along. Mike posted up a GPS sync NTP server that was fairly inexpensive. Um, I know I use NTP for synchronizing the time on, um, say, servers and or network equipment. It's great for your syslogs. So you can actually tell when an event happened. Um, make sure all that stuff is synchronized. But why do other people give a crap? Why would you actually go to the expense of putting a GPS sync server in your network? Well, uh, this is because if Frisk was here because he actually bought one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so that he would uh, no but um, it uh, I'm not I'm not sure of the advantage of this over just like a cell modem that does GPS like I don't understand the difference I think uh, I want to say that I was reading up on this a while back and I think the cell synchronization stuff uh, they're using some hmm, old cell protocol or something like that and it's going to be depreciated pretty soon or something like that. It's, uh, it's that not right? just about that. It's also about connectivity. So what do you actually want to connect to your to your you know atomic clock, and also about precision because a lot of times so for for us uh, or for our audience it may be not uh, that interesting, but for cable providers and for TV signal distribution and uh, for DOCSIS systems, uh, clocking and and proper time synchronization is actually extremely important. And uh, if you are doing TV, uh, I don't know about US, but here in Slovakia, you actually have very strict uh, laws and regulations about how time is distributed through TV, because it can actually be used for emergency services and for other things. So hmm. uh, it's uh, it depends if you want your your atomic clock to be connected to DOCSIS infrastructure, to actual you know uh, cable infrastructure, and etc. So it just depends what you need it for. You know, you need such a uh, such a clock. Yeah, so this, I think there's also security applications with like encryption things or tokens or things like that where they have to be very precise and 
Um, so it depends, it depends on, on the application, right? We, we all know that crypto is very sensitive to proper time synchronization. Hmm. Uh, so it depends. If you have HSMs, you will definitely need extremely precise uh, clocking, right? And HSMs uh, are, are encryption modules, are hardware encryption modules, which you can use for, uh, it's more of a server uh, world thing, not a networking world thing, but uh, yeah. It just proper time synchronization is important in so many applications. It, it depends for what application you need it, and then you need to buy a proper device for that. Oh yeah, I know I was running into this because we had a customer that was trying to install one in the data center and they wanted to do a GPS sync module and there's just limitations on how far you can go. Um, whereas the cell ones, I mean, they work inside of a building. So it's very, because GPS, you have to have line of uh, line of sight to the sky, right? Mm -hmm. So it can hit those birds up there. Um, it, uh, well, it operates at uh, 1900 megahertz, so it'll accommodate some, or near 1900, I think it's like 1910 or something like that. Yeah, it doesn't uh, go through, uh, through a roof that has a steel superstructure with chillers and pumps and <laughs> Sorry, somehow it doesn't uh, make it through all that. 1575 megahertz and 1227. Um, but oh, um, on, on this particular device, I lost the page, um, I did see that um, one difference between this and perhaps others is that this will actually use uh, Cat5 to connect your receipt your GPS receiver sits outside and comes back in with Cat5 and it'll actually go up to it says 200 meters a cable. No, that's pretty good. Um, as opposed to you know some sort of RF uh, cable. About yeah. 650 feet. That's good. That's better than the other gear those people were trying to use. Um, I think we beat that one to death. Let's see. Mike dug up as he always does uh, some interesting stuff from the FCC so whenever you're going to uh, from my understanding release a wireless device you have to file it with the FCC before they'll let you sell it here in the states and it has to get approved um, so Mike picked up one from Microtech it's an RB 953GS5 HNT US any anything specific specifically it, uh, interesting about that I, I think it's the Roughly the same as an existing product. I don't follow Microtech Wireless too much anymore, so I'm not sure which one that is. Uh, but this is the this they started making U.S. variant um, because of new FCC rulings of uh, firmware security and things like that. Um, hopefully, this means that they'll eventually get things certified for DFS and and whatnot. But um, I think this is just kind of an updated certification, or maybe some slight hardware application to, uh, you know, to work with current FCC regulations. Cool. Is this gonna? I mean, does this look like it replaces um, kind of a Soho model, or more like a, an outdoor that's aggregating a lot of radios? Uh, let me look here. Um, awesome. Unless I am mistaken, if this is the same resale of the current ones on the market outside of US, it's actually a provider device, since it has, uh, I think it was three gigabit ports and two SFPs and a triple chain five gigahertz wireless, and it's just a board. Right. So nice, nice. It's for the provider segment. Okay, cool. Uh, moving right along, they also have the Ubiquity U installer that got announced not too long ago, and so from what I understand, that's a little battery packed PoE injector that's got a wireless card I guess made for installers that can plug in on the end of the cable it'll power up the radio and you can configure it I guess with your phone or your laptop is that seem to be it as as far as I'm aware <coughs> well, that's cute it's a little bit different than the because they, they used to have the air gateway installer which required an external power source I think this one has a power source internal just a built-in battery. That's cool. Cool. So it uh, looks like, I looks like you... uh, I see it in a store online, and yeah, it's it's an all-in-one device. Um, it just has a USB in to recharge the battery, and then a PoE out, and some little lights on it. Um, I'm guessing that the retail price will be 200 bucks. 
But I remember, like, I don't know about you, but for the wireless ISP market, that would be a useful device. Like, the amount of gadgetry that, you know, lads carrying batteries and PUE inserters and all sorts of stuff, yeah. trying to light a dish on a, a roof is... Um, so I think things like that are kind of nice to make uh, engineers or installers' lives easier, you know? <laughs> Because um, I think we've all had to try and solve that problem at one time or another, either through scheduled maintenance or in an emergency situation. You're like, oh, you know, you're trying to fashion something together from the back of your truck or something like that, you know? So. Yeah. I took, uh, so I have a cordless drill set from Ryobi, and I took the flashlight because nobody ever uses that. And I just hooked that up to a PoE injector, and it pops in 18 volts. That's what I use. Thanks. Boom. Uh, uh, let's see, moving right along. This is kind of uh, wider news outside of the West Network, but Riverbed just picked up Xeris. Uh, I believe Xeris used to do, um, what was their claim to fame? I think they had access points that you could kind of plug in a whole bunch of radios, and I think they were trying to really do the, the high-density market. I think they also have, I want to say, a switch line of some sort that actually kind Good. of did aggregation for those things. Does that sound right? At the... Uh... I'm not sure on the switching aspect, but yet, uh, you know, they were they were a company that seemed to just kind of start with high, uh, you know, in mind when they started the company, and um, they've uh, yeah, like I think you can put up to like 18 separate radios into one radio enclosure. Um, you can have less, but you can put up to 18 and. Uh, it seemed almost as if it would, uh, you know, you you have some sort of smart antenna array thing. And you put them into smaller sectors as you put more radios in. I'm speculating. I don't. It's been years since I read. Yeah, it's been a long time since I researched them. But uh, you know, they seem to be somebody that you know do that high density stuff pretty good. I think it's proven to them. Somebody bought Ruckus, so that's what's left. It's yours. Yeah. Um, sounds like Riverbed wants to be uh, a networking company. You know, kind of the, I guess everybody knows Riverbed as the WAN accelerator, right? So if you had multiple sites, it would help your throughput in there. I'm guessing by doing some, maybe some dedupe or some TCP modifications or something like that, or maybe some immediate acknowledgments to kind of help out on window sizing at distance, something like that. Um, and now they're trying to. That sounds like kind of own the branch edge, maybe something to that effect, right? You have the wireless built in with your uh, WAN acceleration and maybe some SD WAN sort of thing in there. I guess they're gonna own that portion of the market or attempt to anyway. Um, the only thing I know anybody using Riverbeds for is the WAN acceleration, and I haven't seen too many of those hit the data center for a while. So maybe this is a hail mary trying to become relevant again. I don't know. Do you guys know of any people really using the riverbed stuff? No? Not really your bag? All right. Uh, let's see. That's not my bag, baby. It's not really mine either for the most part. Um, somebody added in here that NetXMS added some approved support for uh, somebody. Ignitenet. Juniper, Extreme, it's Mike, it's Mike. Uh, HP Enterprise, Nexmo, SMS Eagle, and My Mobile API. Uh, I guess that was in uh, a few of the most recent updates. But, Thomas uh, is the uh, uh, resident NetMX, NetXMS expert. You um, have any comment on that? No, I, I could talk for hours. <laughs> <laughs> and yet you uh, don't. But, there, there's been some really good stuff happening on the NetXMS front. Uh, yeah, mainly with uh, new drivers for devices and also uh, particularly with, uh, with tunnels. So uh, historically, NetXMS only supported uh, server-to-agent connections. Uh, and there, there's many reasons for this, and uh, you know it's a long debate which I don't want to get into. But uh, the point is that uh, finally now, since the last major release, uh, actually agent to server connections are supported now uh, through loop tunnels. So agent actually creates a connection to the server, well creates a tunnel, and everything gets routed inside of the tunnel. Uh, 
And uh, why this was a problem before is because NetXMS is so feature rich. Uh, NetXMS agent is not just a simple thing that provides uh, some metrics from the collected uh, OS. It provides many more features and that's why it was a problem, but uh, now they actually implemented SSL tunnels. Uh, so so that's, that's a very nice uh, new feature and it works based on certificates and you have a certificate manager in the server and all of that. So uh, it's of course all based on, on industry standard open source, you know, things. So it's nice and secure. And uh, yeah, so that that is out. Then of course all the new drivers, specifically for IgniteNet uh, uh, wireless. It, it was a, a quite a bit of problem to monitor Ignite through an XMS because, as uh, is sadly the standard in the industry is that the vendors don't uh, don't actually expose proper stuff through SNMP and it was the same with Dignite actually. <laughs> they did an extremely strange thing and only exposed about half of interface table. And NetXMS had a problem with this because it started reading the interface table and then suddenly the device didn't, you know, it responded to some OIDs and some not. And NetXMS thought that was an issue with the SNMP agent on the device. So they had to do some custom implementation and custom driver to fix that. And, so that's also now working as a uh, uh, If uh, pass this along to your your contacts there. If you're having problems with IgniteNet, uh, let me know. I know a guy there. I'll beat him up. <laughs> Mike knows a guy that knows a guy that can kill a guy. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, and uh, the NetXMS guys. I mean, it is an open source project, but they also. I mean, they're guns for hire, right? So if you're going to pay them to take care of something, they're going to put more focus on that, right? So, Because I remember a long time ago, you teased me uh, blatantly about some kind of an app store where you could download uh, like templates for different devices, and then they kept getting these lucrative contracts from governments and other places, so it kept getting put on the back burner. Did that ever get completed or whatever? Uh, it's actually still being worked on, just <laughs> slowly because you know paid customer development see, takes precedence. Yeah, of course. right. See, but now, now, Greg, you can blame Thrift for some of that because I believe Thrift's company has gone with that XMS for some things and made some requests as a part of their development. And uh, so you can blame him for that. I never blame a guy with that good of hair. You just can't do it. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I've got something else on the list here. Run right along. It says IoT, Sigfox, and US. I guess that's Internet of Things. Six. What is Sigfox? Who added this? I have no idea what this is. If you don't know what it is, I, I'm probably the one that added it. Um, All right. What is it? So IoT, Internet of Things. Um, it is lots of buzzwords about things that me a Buzzwords go. Uh, there are a couple companies actually building IoT based networks. Uh, Sigfox is one of them. They're a French company um, that uh, I like. I thought it wasn't much of anything, but apparently uh, on Facebook, there's a couple people that actually have some Sigfox infrastructure, um, you know, on their towers and you know, plug into their network and. Um, <coughs> Uh, and actually, I, I went to call Justin uh, Wilson about it because I saw that uh, he had uh, a common contact in LinkedIn. He talked to them quite a bit actually on Friday. And of course, they wouldn't tell him what they were doing or who they were doing it with. Um, I suppose sort of like a you know a, <coughs> a, a teenager being accused by their parents, you know, wondering what they're doing at night and <coughs> refuse to answer. Um, but uh, you know, like it's a it's a live network in, in in the United States that runs on in the 900 megahertz band, um, and uh, I believe New Zealand it's running at like 860 megahertz. But they're talking to like sounds like it sounds like sounds like they want to talk to vehicles and pull information out of vehicles live, not so much like you know your car, but like a trucking company, you know, real time stats from the truck. Uh, so on and uh they actually have a network map on their website that i can't get to work right now um but um they are in 
I think they're in a couple dozen different countries now. And uh, actually, they're they're deployed in the Chicago area, so I'm going to try to get involved with them. Um, but uh, that's definitely an opportunity, I think, out there for WISPs, not so much in build health, but somebody who wants to get out there and you know, build things. You know, they need places to put towers and you know, upstream connectivity. So people like that be a good partner, I think. Interesting. All right. Well, you get a little bit more information, you'll have to fill us in, as I'm sure you will do. Um, moving on down the list, I believe this was some stuff we added from last week because we just had too much to cover, and so we kind of cut it at the hour mark. But we still have a little bit left, even with Tom's rant. Um, we have... <laughs> we have Australia mandatory metadata collection. I'm not sure who put that in there. Was that you, Thomas? Yeah, that's actually mine. I thought it might be. But that's interesting. Tell us a little bit more about it. So uh, what happened is that uh, earlier this month, is it April? So I think it was earlier this month, yes. Uh, in Australia, the uh, legislature uh, went into action that uh, forces ISPs and uh, internet providers to collect metadata on all of the traffic that you actually you know, uh, run over the ISP. And uh, this has caused quite a bit of uproar, especially from uh, you know, human rights groups and uh, everything, because it's basically fully un, uh, unregulated metadata connection, uh, collection and, and ISPs are required to submit the data to the government. And uh, quite a, actually a few friends that I have in Australia notified me about this and actually one of them bought a MicroTik router immediately when, when this went live and you know configured a few VPNs to get around this. But it's an interesting issue that uh, you know it's a mandatory non-regulated metadata collection from all content and internet providers which is uh, not setting a very good precedent. I would so say. metadata as in uh, like a, what like websites a, people are browsing Netflix to? Like that? Type thing? Like, is that what they're looking for? Uh, uh, full packet headers on everything. Okay, so full packet headers. That's going to be source and destination information. Um, are they? Is it anonymized? So is it just more or less statistical, or is it actually no, going to no, be no. able to be tracked back to the individual? Yeah, it's exactly meant for tracking back to individuals. So if a government wants to know who did something and when, you know, they simply ask. There is no from, and and I might be wrong here because I haven't studied the uh, laws, of course. Uh, but uh, if the government wants to know what you are doing, there is no uh, court order needed. There is no nothing because the data is submitted by the ISPs, and they just know. It's interesting. So be able to track your information, what you're doing, and back to the person themselves. Wasn't Australia the one that has uh, like the porn filter on their national? Yeah, a, a lot of things are actually blocked in Australia. Yeah, the most popular torrent trackers and torrent indexers, and yeah. Well, I mean, it's as funny as as landmass big as Australia is. I think what is there only like. 20 million people or something like that so it's the size Ugh. of a major american city you know like population wise so it as, as crazy as it sounds that they would affect something nutty like this um, you have to remember that people wise they're so small so you can't it's, actually do it's crazy not about uh, the number of people right it's about being uh, because this is of course the film industry and the rights holders industry and the you know ip owners industry pushing laws on an entire country and uh, this is actually where it came from so these laws originally came from from the ip holders and rights holders industry and uh, it's actually, it doesn't matter the number of people. It, what matters is that uh, such a breach in, in privacy can be forced onto a whole country and go through whole well, no, laws just... and, and sanctified without, you know, there is no checklist, there is no court orders, there is... Yeah, yeah, and to me it's not necessarily the number of people, it's how could legislation like this be passed? And for me, you know, because I had thought about this too, like uh, their gun laws where, you know, they could widespread after you know, really one major event, there was there was a, a mass shooting or whatever over there, and then they um, shortly thereafter passed legislation to, you know, really tighten gun laws. It was, it was pretty much a, a buyback from the entire country. And so looking at how could you actually affect a change like that, 
because we could never do that here in the states you know something as controversial as that would never happen here in the u.s and i think it's just we have too many people and the fact that we're so spread out that uh if you go state to state you might as well be in a different country you know and so uh mm. the the morality the sense of community is different here in say texas versus new york or san francisco you know uh, over well, in california almost, it almost happens with the um with SOPA, you know, in the US, and only that guy who ended up unfortunately committing suicide, uh, where the government kind of went, seemed to go after him, I forget his name, but uh, he invented his RSS feeds or was the developer behind it. Um, there's actually a Netflix video about him, just basically what they say is that, you know, and the dangerous thing about what Thomas Kernex said is that you can retroactively, so someone pisses off someone, and then you can go back through all the records and find something to prosecute them on. So it's the widespread intelligence gathering and then the retroactive application of um, of, of an investigative powers uh, without probable cause. So they piss you off, you go back through their whole history, find something that you can prosecute them on. And, and then take them down. Gotcha. So, that's so all you have to do is come up with some sort of probable cause and then every bit of information they've ever produced, you can go back and prosecute them on that? So, so probably, would... as I said, I haven't studied this uh, particular Australian law that passed, but here you wouldn't even have to have probable cause because you don't require a court order. Yeah. Right, so if they had some kind of automated system that was searching for some specific content, and it could key yeah. in and then an investigation would kick off and then boom, whatever. Not just that, but it's not as simple in the digital age, right? If, if something originates from your IP address, it doesn't mean it was, it, it really doesn't. It, you might have had a virus, your network might have been compromised, you might have had open Wi-Fi, you just might have had a visitor that came in, you know, or somebody with a laptop stayed outside your house, you know, crashed That's your Wi-Fi. true from wifi. a technical perspective, but the law hasn't caught up. And well, I think here in the U.S. we've had some court cases that uh, somewhat recently ruled an IP is not a person. In local, yeah. or it's not it's not national, I don't think. Well, so you can always you, cite you a case. You can see how it can be actually very controversial if you do mass meta, uh, metadata collection on, <laughs> on based on IP addresses and try to identify in, individuals. You know, it's, is that in like Germany, saying, you have to... Um, Make sure your Wi-Fi has a password on it, and when you get your internet, it, you know you sign something to that effect so that you but can't that, claim that doesn't work that either. Kind of I mean, we are and, the networking guys. How hard is it to break into a Wi-Fi? It's not hard. None of the private Wi-Fi, even VPA2, is very easy to break into if the password is not something crazy. You know, you have the authentication attacks, then you do dictionary attacks. It's not that hard. If somebody really wants to break into your Wi-Fi, all it requires is, is time and computational power, which is really easy to come by these days. Well, and then they don't have to do that either. You know, it, you know, they could, you know, they could spoof if they, you know, compromise the modem. They could be, you know. Just sniffing all of the packets on the cable modem, for instance, you know, and the cable is supposed to only pass what's yours, but you compromise the cable modem, you know, you could pretend you're anybody. Absolutely, like the Vault Seven thing, where you know, once you get root access to a device, you can actually proxy and generate packets and all that type of stuff. So you can actually frame someone. No, look, it's bad precedent because rather than going, you're doing mass data collection rather than targeted data collection. Which um, is, um, you know, there's a massive difference. Um, and like what Tom says, it is coming from recording rights and the intellectual property rights of people. Uh, and the problem is the contagion uh, from that into your privacy and other people and human rights, like being able to research and access pertinent information. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a dangerous uh, step towards kind of Big Brother, 1984, well, George Orwell stuff. Well, I mean, I think too, you know, it, um, it, it's dangerous from a lot of aspects, right? So not just prosecution, but think about too, um, that information's being held by the government, right? And so it's in some database somewhere that somebody with power will be able to search. So I don't know, say for example, they wanted to get something done in another district, well, they just dig up a little dirt on you know, the candidate that controls that district, 
And then once you have that leverage, you can do whatever you want, right? So it's it's not necessarily prosecution, but it could be absolute control over any political party. Yeah. Or the database can be compromised. Yeah. Somebody right. steal the database. Yeah, if that thing spills out. And nothing is safe, right? Somebody asked me, um, it was a high school kid the other day, I was giving a tour to her. So they said, well, how do you keep your computer from getting hacked? And I said, you unplug it and you put it in a closet. You know, that's the only way you can completely make sure anything's safe. And then I guess you could beat it with a hammer and then burn it in a fire. Uh, that's about the only thing you could do. Um, so yeah. if there's a will, there's a way somebody can get that information and it can be exploited in the wrong way. Um, do I think, I don't know, right? It's, it's a lot of times you see that kind of stuff reactionary, right? So something catastrophic happens. So, uh, yeah. you know, some guys, uh, yeah, I don't want to get into it, but you know, something bad happens and then people have a knee jerk reaction to that thing. But was there, was, was this an, does this feel like a knee jerk reaction to something that happened in Australia that I didn't, I just, I don't know, I don't, I guess I just don't keep up a lot with them. No, no, it's just being forced by the, by the industry. That's interesting. As in the, the you know, the, the rights holder industry. I don't know. And that's, I it's might be wrong precedent. as well. So, so if somebody knows more about this, please correct me and correct all of us. But that's, that's the information that I have. What a bag of dicks. <laughs> There you go. There you go. I don't know, man. That stuff. That stuff worries me. It scares me. I try and think of all angles, right? You know, just uh, be devil's advocate and why you would do these things and and what purpose it could serve. And uh, I, I guess uh, theoretically, there's good in everything, right? Good and bad sides. Uh, you know, it could stop some kind of terror attack. Uh, but then again, we just spit out. You know several show-stopping things that could happen because of it. It's, it's fairly frightening. Uh, I'm, I'm against giving absolute control over to any government. I, I, don't, I really have an authoritarian problem uh, when you get down to the core of it. I think that's, that's my issue. Um, Wait, but so someone in Texas? Has, a, <laughs> has an authoritarian problem? Yeah, man, born and raised. I guess it's in my... Uh, it's in my DNA and my heritage. I can't help it. Um, uh, I'm not a crazy gun nut or anything like that, though. Just kind of, you know, a regular nut in general. Uh, we have some other security stuff on here now that we beat the hell out of that one. Uh, new Chrome consider start SSL root certs as untrusted. Is that... Well, it didn't... Um, who was it? Uh, was Semantic. Semantic got in trouble by Google not too long ago as well, right? Because they yeah. issued, I think, 30, I want to say 30,000 or 80,000. Um, in... Well, they, they originally thought it was in the in the low thousands, and then they came out and was like, yeah, it's 30,000 that go. we issued. And... Yeah, improperly issued certificates. Um, so those guys are getting smacked down pretty hard by Google. Yeah. And I can't imagine Google coming after a big cert they're, trust They're like actually... That. Google's not going to trust any of those certs after a while um, for more than six months. So the most you'll be able to get from those guys is a six-month cert. Yeah, yeah. So it's, in effect, going to cripple anybody attempting to use Well, rightly so. They, they screwed up. I mean, everyone's putting your trust in, you, in those guys to do that correctly, and you screw up, you don't get the right anymore. Yeah, but I think the industry's moving to 90-day certs anyways. It's a lot safer. Who was like, there's no, no, no real way of revoking certs once they get out. So, they're only good for 90 days, and automation's good enough to keep renewing them. Then it doesn't really matter. Oh. Yeah. The uh, the GRC guy, the Security Now podcast, Steve Gibson. Steve yeah. Gibson. Yeah, he uh, he actually had some good information on a lot of that, and uh, I think he said these guys really need to lock their infrastructure down, do the right thing, because they basically have been given a license to print money right yeah they hand yep. out a few bits that cost them nothing and you know they get actual cash for it so they're literally printing nothing money doing nothing so well, it's an ev sir then there is some someone doing something supposedly so mm. yeah but like let's say the let's say the non-ev ones where it's literally just oh it came from this email address gmail.com oh he must be at gmail.com administrator <laughs> I, I don't know why you would go for 
an, a, a cert from those guys for anything but a EV these days, or buy oh. anything but a EV, because you can use Let's Encrypt to get just that bare minimum of encryption. So it's that not code. actually that simple. <laughs> And uh, why I particularly find uh, like this, you know, this is not wrong. If there really was some wrongdoing at, at start as a cell, then you know they need to fix it. But the problem with Let's Encrypt is, and we use Let's Encrypt uh, extensively. Actually, all our websites are, are Let's Encrypt. But the problem with uh, Let's Encrypt is that for services which don't let you use third part which is the utility from Let's Encrypt that issues and renews certs. Uh, the 90-day certs are actually really painful. Just imagine you know, having a Mikrotik SSTP server that you need to actually... So if everything supported it, then your argument, this particular but point, would, would not be... Yeah, the, if, I mean, if, if I was able to run uh, cert pod on everything, but it, it's not possible, right? Because on, on uh, yeah. embedded I mean, it, it might be very, very soon. You might start seeing it. Are you then, sending a support yes, ticket to Microtech? Then yes, yeah. So I mean, I I've got problems with it. I mean, I, I run CN Maestro, and you can't. They don't even have instructions on how to replace the cert for that. And then you run Unify Server. I mean, that's a pain in the butt to to replace with a Let's Encrypt cert. I mean, I, I do it, but you know, there's all kinds yeah, of services was, that have problems with that. And I'm not saying exactly, that yeah, that what's, that, I'm getting that that you shouldn't have to go and buy a twenty dollars cert from you know, namecheap.com or whatever to get your three-year cert for some embedded device or something that's in the ass to use Let's Encrypt on. I'm just saying if it, if if everything was automated, then the 90-day cert yeah. is the way to go because you're not going to get this problem with uh, start SSL issuing certs for your bank. You know, so... And if they if that stuff does happen, and it should only be valid for ninety days. Yeah. So the the problem actually is that uh, yeah the print it's it's a printing money problem right. And for me uh, currently there is only two free ways to get certs, which is start with SSO and let's encrypt, right? If you want the actual free you know level one certificate uh, that you know you don't do EV you don't do anything, you have no other choice. And uh, with the way that uh, every, you know, all services are moving to SSL now, like every single service. And, and if you count the number of those little $20 certs that you need, it's, it's now in, in you know, 2017, it's not a trivial amount of money anymore if you want to really secure all of your services properly. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so you, you have two options, right? You, you have uh, Let's Encrypt, which we talked about has obvious limitations on devices where you can run certbot. And then you had Start SSL. So we actually on ourselves were using a lot of Start SSL, the, the free cheap certificates uh, on a on lot of other services. Uh, and yes, now I, I have to figure out how to fix that because uh, New Chrome just won't work with it anymore. That's yeah. interesting. What's the rationale? Why aren't they supporting it anymore? Uh, so, the, you know, the Chrome and uh, Mozilla simply removed the Start SSL CA from their trust store, which means that all certificates issued by Start SSL now show as invalid in, in all of your major browsers. Hmm. Nice. And, uh, yeah, of course, there were some warnings before, and Chrome said they were going to do it, but honestly, who knew? Like, like you know. <laughs> Uh, I found out when uh, all of our that's, uh, all of our services using Start SSL so it started, uh, you know, showing red uh, pop-ups in, in the browser. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, I, I am not saying it's not the right thing to do. Obviously, if they're issuing things for a bank and for other things. It's uh, obviously, uh, you know, not what they should be doing. And they should be punished for that. I'm just saying that the overall state of of the uh, of the said industry, so to speak, is very. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, yeah, <laughs> not happy at, at the state mm. of, of this current. Interesting. So another one that I think is the Thomas one is the Turkey Blocks Wikipedia sacks another 4,000 officials. Yeah, no, I, so I added that one in. And, oh, yeah, yeah it's just Turkey seems to be moving backwards under Tayseb Erdogan, and uh, they recently uh, just shows that people will vote badly and giving him another 
power, more powers, executive, making it an executive presidency, like uh, making Turkey an executive presidency rather than a parliamentary democracy, like uh, so more like the states or France as opposed to and having control to appoint court officials and stuff like that. But just Turkey seems to be going backwards and they like blocking. So they used to be a lot more, I think, secular. They just seem to be more version towards um, a kind of, I won't say a theolog uh, theocracy or anything like that, but they certainly seem to have uh, this moral uh, brigade and this type of crack going on. And uh, just Ticey Berdowan seems to be able to control uh, quite a bit in the, in the country at the minute since the coup, which um, you wonder whether it was staged or not, you know, mm. as in was it just allowed happen when it was going to fail and then used it as an excuse to crack down. It was just a pity because they were an EU candidate country and I think they're just going further and further away from that. Uh, I think Turkey's going to be in for dark days ahead, you know, when you're blocking Wikipedia from your citizens. Uh, what's next, you know? So, sorry for the people of Turkey. Yeah, it's... <laughs> It perplexes censorship. me, kind of, internet censorship, how how that's allowed in these countries and things like that. But, um, I mean, obviously it serves their purposes, so that makes sense. I guess from that perspective, I'm trying to control the people, so I control the flow of information as best I can. Yeah. Um, he can't control system. us, though! In your face! Thank okay, you, sorry. <laughs> I'm the angry Irishman. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> Um. Yeah, that's interesting. No, well, it's, it's not so... interesting. It's it, it. It's just I don't know. It's a very different way of thinking, and it perplexes me how they can get away with that. And I guess yeah. more people just need to understand what VPNs are and how they operate. Yeah. It's best I can say about that. Um, SSL VPN, so that way it looks like you're just doing web traffic and not. You know, PPTP or something. Yeah, well, PPTP can be cracked fairly easily. It just looks oh, like right. noise on port 443. Still look like web traffic. Yeah. Uh, let's see. PPTP would be enough to get around the block, but uh, not for the privacy side of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like if it's, I mean, if you're in a, if you're in a unfriendly country doing unfriendly things, I would use something a little bit stronger than PPTP. <laughs> to try and get it, you know, I mean, yeah, I guess it serves a purpose, but um, that technology has been depreciated for years. Uh, it really is, you know, I guess if you're if you're at a hotel and you're trying to just keep average schmucks from listening to what you're doing or uh, getting past their uh, Netflix block, then PPTP is probably great for that, right? It doesn't yeah. consume many resources on your client or on the router itself, but if you're trying to go for security on it. Yeah, try and harden that up a bit. What do you guys use most of the time? Is it L2TP or I, I heard Thomas talking about SSTP. Is that what you guys have transitioned to for the most part? So uh, we actually switched. Uh, I think we talked about it at, at the last podcast. We actually switched to using IPsec X out almost exclusively through all of our services. And uh, yeah, I mentioned that it works great on Microtik for us. It's supported across just about any client natively. Uh, except Windows, but then you have Shrew, which is a free, you know, free VPN client, yeah. which works great as well. But uh, we used to do before. We used to do a lot of LTTP IPsec. We used to have a huge LTTP IPsec uh, networks, and our, all our clients had that. But now we switch to Xout, and if everything else fails, of course there is SSTP, which is really nice that it's SSL. But then you get into TCP inside TCP congestion. So, so if you really want performance and, and good TCP windowing and avoiding all those issues, then you know something UDP based or pure IPsec based is much better. Gotcha. Cool. Um... One more thing on the list. I've got Fios Gig. Is that Mike? Did you put that on there? No, I put that on there. Miller. Fios has got um, big service in our area now. It's like 960 down and 880 up. Consistent with the price like seventy dollars a month. Wow, how's yeah, that? But, uh, uh, how's that doing? That uh, AT&T has about that 
in a lot of my Wisp area. Yeah. They call it gig, but it's not, it's not gig. It's only 880 up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's false advertising. Let's, let's get on asterisk. the bandwagon. Where's There's the pitch an asterisk that says up to, and it depends on where you're at. Um, yeah. You know what I think is so funny? I've had this conversation with a lot of people. Um, is it different giving somebody 100 megs versus a gig? In my wow. opinion, it's really not because if you if you have 15 megs, that's going to, for 95% of the population, that's going to give you everything you want. You're going to be able to stream multiple Netflix uh, sessions or YouTube. Uh, We've, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Greg, but uh, a single 4K Netflix stream is 18 megabits. I know, but I don't know very many people that are actually running 4K Netflix streams. It's usually they're they're watching them on small devices and their kids are doing it on mobile things like that, right? Yeah. So it's it's fairly. I'm just saying, like kind of on so average, we've, it's not we've got fairly large buildings, and one of the buildings that we have is right on our dark fiber. You yeah, know, it's yeah. got basically 10 gig connectivity to everything we peer to. And I've uncapped that property for weeks at a time just to see like, What's is there do? any change in the usage graph there for the whole property and. It's not enough to really right. It's, I mean, it doesn't matter how much bandwidth you get. You're not going to change your habits for the most part. Yeah, right? no. So I mean, most you're... people are still streaming Netflix. They're still streaming Hulu. They're, you know, it, it's just the people that use that download or have some kind of um, chain set up to torrent TV yeah, shows uh... automatically, and then it's like they do it and they're done, and that's it. And it, they're not to really saturate a huge pipe like that. You got to be reselling it or something like that um it's a well and like that's like you know i see some wisps that are still you know really concerned about you know peer-to-peer -peer traffic you know i know a guy that yeah it's it's just really? it just you know oh, the, you know you, know, you got to block peer-to-peer -peer. i'm like who does that <laughs> like i mean yeah no i mean still, we, don't, we don't block that there's still a little bit of you know use of, of but like you know you go back five or ten years ago and yeah, you know, peer to peer is a big thing because there was no legitimate source of content. It yeah. was bigger than most of our pipes, is what the problem was. Like, yeah. it, it was a problem back in 2009 when we had, you know, 100 megs and people were touring oh, through yeah. that. So, yeah, with the advent of Netflix and Hulu and all the streaming services, I've seen our um, torrent traffic go way down. Yeah. Also, Netflix has very. Like it's very adaptive the algorithm you know it, it uses as much bandwidth as as you give it almost and then but if if you you know cap it i've seen it let's say for smaller wi wireless isps where if they cap the bandwidth the rate adapts you know whatever way the compression or the streaming works it actually still has a pretty good picture but uh, and it's, it's not pausing it's uh, pretty easy to actually cap uh, netflix in fact we try to tell them, is there any, can you see any problems on our network with Netflix? And they're actually pretty good, like they'll say, no, we're not seeing any irregularities or any weird stuff. So I've actually emailed like the peering Netflix lads and just said, we're not get. we don't seem to be using you that much on the peering, is there any issue there? They're like, no, no, it's just, you know, maybe the user base aren't using Netflix as much, but um, it's been growing quite considerably. Um, on our network for the past few years, you know, but but just when it was, you know, when you see it sudden drop, you're like, is there some issue? Did they change something? There's a problem on your network. If you want to get information from them, just I don't. It's, you, you don't want to be, you know. Usually, some customers just wait a month and they're absolutely insanely pissed off with you because Netflix has to be working properly, and then you're like. And it has to be working for a month, and you're like, well, you only told me now, so <laughs> give me a break. But just when we see the graphs, you're like, oh, that's a drop, you know. The only provider, really, that I see in where if Google sometimes move off the exchange from time to time, that's a massive swing in traffic. Like, I'd say Google are well over half of our traffic. Yeah, you can you can tell how much peer-to-peer uh, -peer you have by looking at your peering and then your transit links. <laughs> Because you're not peering with any of the other ISPs like Verizon and Comcast, they don't peer. So you're, you got you got your content, and then you've got your 
transit pipes for that stuff. <laughs> yeah. And like, you just see it, like, so. I was, uh, I remember meeting that, just the iDoc, uh, a few of the Google peering engineers, and I was saying, guys, you sometimes scare us to just see the traffic, you know, they just obviously are doing maintenance, they shut down the, they're not advertising as many prefixes into us, and you just see a massive drop of traffic, you're like, this is something I said, this is something I did, you know, <laughs> it, traffic, it just moves over, and then, you know, after a few hours, it just comes back, they're like, oh, okay, they're not pissed off at me, I haven't annoyed them or anything, like, but it is great, like, to, to suppose so it's funny that when you're on the exchanges, you see all that type of behavior, you know, you're like, oh, the lads must be doing maintenance, oh, they're doing an upgrade, and, you know, you're pulling it from London, let's say, rather than Dublin, and then it comes back to Dublin, and you're like, yay. <laughs> so, sorry. No, go, go, go. Sorry, my freaking friends who might be a thousand miles away from me, we're here at Google Pop. Yeah, and it's just, well, I mean, kind of going back to the to the Fios gig, it's it's all marketing, right? People aren't going to change their habits. Nothing's going to adjust. But how do you overcome that? I pay 50 bucks for 150 right now. I'm good. That for 70, uh, $20 more a month. And there's no, you know, that's the price of it. Mine is 50 right now. It's going to go up as soon as these discounts expire. So I'm, I'm going to try to get on that. <laughs> Jump in on it. I'm jumping in on that, just... man. So. 4K. Ah, it's, uh, yeah, it's another thing is that realistically you will not be able to, even even if you could actually get that, that gig down to the customer, you will not be able to pull content at a gig. It's uh, even even if you want it, at least not not from my experience, not here in, in Europe. It, it's very hard to actually find, you know, CDNs and servers where you can actually pull content at a gig. Yeah. yeah, I know I've done some stuff like um, I'm doing a Linda course right now, and since I got bought by Microsoft, they don't use Google Docs anymore, which I hate because I loved the collaboration part of Google Docs and that stuff anyway. So I have to sign into yet another service, and so I have to use Box.com, which is the Microsoft's version of Dropbox or whatever. And I pulled a file, and I was getting I don't know, 400 megabits a second. With that, so it was, yeah, that's pretty good. But it was that fast, and then done. So I would have been just as fine if it took four seconds instead of one second. You know what I mean? It, it makes really like. I don't know, just at the quality of networks these days, that little difference means nothing to me. But then again, I'm an informed consumer, and how many other people out in the, the real world can say that they understand it the way we do? But uh, Google actually said that uh, they, did, they released some research where they delayed the searches by half a second. Just, you know, just put in a delay just to see how it affects user behavior, just the actual now this wasn't the, this is just in terms of displaying the results. And it notices that people, if the searches were much quicker, people would use it more and more kind of indiscriminately. And then it notices that people were kind of being more discerning when it was slightly slower. They were actually thinking about what they were searching a little bit more. Uh, and then they sped it back up again, and it took a while for the user behavior to actually recover and the level of searches Half that work second. was fast. So it's kind of unusual. I suppose if you're doing like, um, I hate saying it, but cloud storage, you know, like where your files are in the clouds, um, it's something that we haven't necessarily gotten on the bandwagon. You know, we use our email and all that, that's all cloud-based, but in terms of just, you know, your, like what you were saying, your docs, like that's obviously a use case where the gig would uh, help, or if you have multiple people in your organization who are uploading and downloading files, I think that's obviously, like you're effectively getting land speeds, internet connectivity, which is pretty nice. So I think in that case, it might be a use case for it for like Justin Miller's area, you know, small businesses, uh, where they might be using 365, you know, Microsoft or Google, not maybe not Google Docs, but you know, where you're actually uploading big files all the time. Or yeah. Download. Yeah, I guess so, I was thinking from just kind of a user at their house sort of perspective. I'm sorry, I didn't mean yeah. to interrupt. What were you going to say, Tom? 
so, so there is a difference. Right? There is a big difference between having uh, some download speed and there is a big difference by having your searches uh, delayed by half a second. And, yeah. and the difference is, and uh, there is also a bunch of research on this, that if you are doing a continuous task, a continuous flow of work, Actually, any delay uh, uh, higher than 200 milliseconds to our brain, it feels like there is a pause, there is a breakage in that continuous flow of, of the task that you are doing. Yeah. So, so that's why Google, you know, when you are searching for something, it's a continuous flow task, but that's uh, very different to when you are downloading a file, which, which is not a continuous flow. It's just, oh, I want this file and I'm prepared to wait for it because I know it's going to download. So, yeah. you know, and that's it's... a speed versus latency. Yeah, and to, to that end too, I um, being in a data center and having to convince people that it's a good idea to put your equipment in a data center, uh, part of that is um, uh, remote desktop, right? So doing thin clients and things like that. And, and part of that research too says, yeah, if you have um, 200 milliseconds plus of latency between you and your thin client, it's perceptible to people and it becomes annoying. And right, so one of the main things is when an IT infrastructure shifts, to a thin client, they are going to have people bitching, right? They're already going to be upset. So if you introduce this amount of latency as well, uh, it's yeah. usually a deal breaker. So if you can have it 100 milliseconds or less, you're usually super solid to do sort of a thin, you know, and that's just sending your keyboard clicks and whatever and then waiting for that information to come yeah. back, right? So uh, there is truly like psychological difference between uh, latency of you inputting something and then waiting for it to come back versus how fast you can download something. But if you look at it, let's say, if, if you were looking at files or working on a file server on a LAN, I would consider that a continuous process if you're, oh, I need to check this file, I need to open this file, let's say it's a CAD file or something like that. If you're doing it over the internet, we are trained that it's a, an operation in itself. While if you have that like speed, you know, it would become a continuous flow. That that was the kind of point I was trying to make is that if you have that type of speed, that accessing files becomes more like a continuous activity, uh, Tom, you know? Yeah, that's so a that, crazy future yeah, yeah. to think we're going to be accessing CAD files over the internet like that. Or yeah, like uh, some... some um, parts in assembly and spin it around, job done. Like, you know, it's mad the way things Or like geological change. information, because some of those guys' maps are just astronomically huge I've got tons of GIS I mean it, I've hundreds I see probably a hundred gigs or more of GIS information yeah that stuff's crazy it gets out of hand pretty quick um, let's see we beat the hell out of that one too do you guys have any uh, anything else off the top of your head or are you ready to put a bow on it we're in about an hour and 20 you talk about BSD again I don't know <laughs> It's not. <laughs> it's not. Uh, I thought you were going to do just like a podcast all on your own, just talk about OpenBSD. I thought that was the thing. We'll do uh, that someday. Um, oh, it's not on the list. Here we go. I'll add it to our list. OpenBSD. <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, added it to our Google Docs right now. Yeah, or white noise, as we'll call it. Um, uh, let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's put a bow on this one. Uh, Thomas Kernak in Slovakia. If people want to get a hold of you on the interwebs, how do they do that? So as always, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Just Google for me and uh, you can find me on Facebook, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, whatever you have. Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly easy to find. And uh, yeah. yeah. Find him on Unimus.net. So He's got a you're... good backup oh, yeah. check, there. Check, check us out at, at Unimus, yeah. So did you say that you're pretty and easy to find? Oh yeah, I just, you could have stopped it easy. There you are. <laughs> Let's see, uh, Tom Smith. If people want to find you out there on the big bad internet, how do they do that? Send me a LinkedIn, Skype, uh, Facebook, email, my cell number. Actually, I have to give a shout out to JT and RF Elements who actually used my postal address and. Uh, <laughs> Didn't send me a slab of beer, but a pallet load of beer, which uh, <laughs> I would say it was pretty awesome. So maybe the next podcast will uh, have a little slot just dedicated to. Uh, so um, I'm holding the beer in trust for my other Brothers Wisp members. Um, it's diminishing, <laughs> but it's actually, you know, there are five. I got 25 liter barrels of 
beer and so it's like 10 pints in each one so it's kind of good it's for not, like 25 days <laughs> i know i know like it's it, it, it it's for parties so for the first party we we went through four of them and it was like <laughs> but uh so we're, we're we're now down to uh we're down to about i we've consumed in this house uh six of them and then i've given a couple to people who have done us favors and stuff like that so just uh i was kind of <laughs> woken up at half eight and you know this truck backing up and the uh, tail lift and bring it out pallet and i'm going Master, do you order some i don't know what's and so it was kind of nice though from the guys in our fellow so um yeah i'll have to uh yeah so guys you can come to Ireland. Uh, I'm holding them in trust. Uh, there is a, a storage charge, which means that there's a residual drain on the beer, so you have to <laughs> before it goes. Interest but, uh, is taken no, out of the cargo. It was, it was kind of cool because uh, they definitely uh, over delivered at that one. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> but, uh, I'm sure Mike had f- nothing to do with it. That's not the first thing to show up at your house, though, is it? <laughs> no, the Trump, uh, yeah. It, although I have to say, uh, you know, uh, marking the 100 days anniversary of Trump's uh, presidency. I would say that uh, the the uh, the palate of beer uh, was uh, was very welcome. <laughs> Golly. All right. So Mike Hammett out of Chicago, hey. if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way? Uh, those with Facebook, I suppose. I mean, you can find me a thousand ways, but I'd do that pretty well. Okay, yeah. Mike is yeah. the keeper of the Brothers Wiss Facebook page. I think maybe five total posts have come from other people. Everything else is coming from him. So whenever you get those snappy responses, those comebacks, uh, that's all Mike. Mike trolling networks that are not uh, peered with an oh, IX. On LinkedIn, yeah. Yeah, I did that too. <laughs> I, uh, I made a post on LinkedIn a few weeks ago. I forget the exact words, but something like, uh, if your network isn't done in IX, then it's not much of a network at all, now is it? <laughs> so, can I ask you, is your network at home on an IX? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go. I'm nice. hoping to have it there soon. But, uh, <laughs> Good uh, times. Not, not many get the deal that I get uh, out of the data center that I'm at, so... Fair enough. A little bit of reason. I hear you. I hear you. All right, Miller, if people want to get a hold of you on the internet, how do they do that? Um, <laughs> Dynastatic.net. Do you still blog? I haven't put something up there, but I was thinking about putting one up there for Run Deck and um, some of the other stuff that I've been working on, but I've been super busy. Do what? <laughs> <laughs> well, we we just put up a Siklu five gigabit per second link. That took uh, quite a while. Um, trying to do the outdoor fiber correctly. Um, getting the wrong stuff. Ordering stuff. Fusion splicing that kind of stuff. Cool. Um, that took us like a week to do. It's ridiculous. Uh, but hopefully the next one we do will go up a lot, a lot quicker. And then it, it rocks. By the way. Um, and uh, household stuff. Just bought a lawnmower today. Point fingers. Yeah, that's no, uh, when I, I used to I used to do mowing in college, and I said as soon as I am occupationally able, I will never mow a lawn <laughs> again. And I haven't mowed a lawn in about five years, and I love it. We got a nice self-propelled one that moves as fast as you walk, kind Don't of care. thing. And Don't care. Don't it's care. It's nice, but. <laughs> Ones that kind of go around their solar power on the yard, the yeah. whole thing, and now <laughs> kind of like having a sheep, it kind of keeps nibbling away. All right, if you want to find me, Greg Soul, you can hit me on gregsoul.com. Uh, catch me on LinkedIn. I occasionally blog, not nearly as much as I used to or ought to. And I was actually thinking about it last night, but I'm working on this Linda course and I think, well, I could do that or I could do the thing that pays me. So I'll do the thing that pays me. Um, speaking of things that pay us, if you guys are sponsors or want to be sponsors, 
or have equipment and want somebody to try it out, give us a uh, give us a shout. I'm sure we can find somebody to take your stuff. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, any questions? So guys that aren't going to be able to show up to uh, the mum in May, if you have any routing questions, anything sort of microtick related that you'd like us to address in the panel, we need a little bit of fodder just in case people get shy. Uh, so we'll have a little bit of stuff kind of locked and loaded. Some topics to talk about. Also, if more than one person asks us about the same thing, we know it's something we need to cover, so we'll make sure we will. Um, other than that, questions, comments, hit us on Facebook. That's facebook.com forward slash the brothers wisp. Uh, or if you're old school, you can hit us at contact us at thebrotherswisp.com. Um, if nothing else, I guess thank you guys for continually listening. Um, if you are still awake, that is. Otherwise, Thanks, and we will see you next time. I think we have one more before the mum, and we'll keep pumping it out, keep uh, pushing that brand. Thanks, guys. See ya.